It bites agents in the you know what all the time because I see it in litigation. There's so many lawsuits that we file or have to defend because of an ambiguity in the contract that the agent drafted. I had one where the agent said, you know, don't worry about that. The seller didn't disclose it. They're 100% liable. And turns out that wasn't something the seller had to disclose. And that was bad legal advice. Forcing the communication to be different on the front end with the client is going to be a really good thing in all of this. You know, people are like, well, you know, like first time home buyers, it's going to be harder for them, you know, to like buy a home now and this and that. And, you know, I find that super interesting as well, because I'm aware that there has definitely been a very hard push, concerted, intentional propaganda, if you even will, for a long time about owning a home and that it's an investment and that sort of thing. And really, when you do the math on it, like it's not actually a good investment. Uh, it is a forced savings account, though. And, you know, we are... We, I say collectively, like as a society, are notoriously not good at saving. Uh, We're good at consuming. So owning a home forces you to save money. And for most people, the vast majority of their net worth is tied up in the equity in their home. So I understand like wanting people to do that. I think we've lowered the barrier so low to do it. Like everybody should do it. You know what I mean? Where it borderlines on financial like irresponsibility. Because, you know, I'm sure you see at closings all the time, like people don't even have like 2000 bucks if something comes up and you're like, dude, you probably shouldn't buy a house. Like that's not. So I think if people have to save more, if people have to, um, you know, postpone purchasing, like it's okay to like, you know, kind of sacrifice to get something that you want over time. I don't think that that's bad. What is your perspective on that? So I a hundred percent agree with you on that. However, I do think, I mean, in this world and especially in this country with the, you know, materialism and consumerism, I don't think that that is going to change because of this. I think that people are going to still try to find a way to stretch themselves to get the biggest house they can afford and, you know, with still have the nice car and the this and the that, like that's just our culture. And I don't see that shifting much at all. Although from a financial perspective, it absolutely should shift. Um, and I, I say that because, you know, this is going to spur and create different, you know, AI technology type companies. And I've seen the lawyers that are like, I'm going to capitalize on this and I'm going to do a flat fee for the transaction, or I'm going to do a a 1% for the transaction so that they can use me. I mean, there's going to be all of these other options that are going to start popping up that is going to allow people, I think, to, you know, to still get into these homes. And I mean, at the end of the day, I still think it makes a lot of sense in most cases for the seller to offer compensation to a buyer's agent. Like I really do. There are so many ways to maintain the seller's kind of net bottom line while providing compensation to an agent so that they know both sides are well represented that I think it still makes sense to, you know, for sellers to do that. Instead of defending, which I've seen a lot of stuff from agents like, Oh, you know, I work all these hours and don't you know who I am. And I got to deal with all these crazy people. And I'm like, I don't know why you think that's a good idea to be doing saying that like in media, but like, instead of defending, it should be educating on the economics and the advantages and disadvantages. So what I've been kind of coaching agents on is like, you know, now that we've come to an agreement, let's say about a listing presentation, I'm listing your home. Now that we've come to agreement in terms of products and service, I'm going to be providing in the professional fee for me to do that, whatever that percentage is or whatever we agreed to. Now it's time to have a conversation about compensation to a buyer and a buyer's agent and the, the advantages and disadvantages of providing that compensation. So we'll go over the options that you have and whatever you decide, I'm going to support you 100%. Fair enough? And they're like, sure. So I'm curious, have you heard, you know, some of this news with like NAR and stuff? And they're like, well, yeah. And then you take their temperature. What have you heard? Instead of verbally vomiting, instead of like, like, here's how I'm pontificating. Like, what have you heard? Well, I heard something like, I mean, do I have to offer compensation? It's like, well, yeah, I know. I know it's a little bit confusing, right? Because you're getting all this stuff from the media. And I don't know about you, but like, it's very difficult for me and other topics to figure out what's actually true or not. And there's two rule changes that really actually affect you at all as a seller. So I'd like to review them with you so you're clear on them. Would that be okay? Well, yeah. Well, the first one is, is that we're no longer able to make an offer of compensation in the multiple listing service. We still can make an offer of compensation, just not there. 
The second is, is that if a buyer's agent is working with a buyer, they need to enter into an agreement and be clear on the compensation and how that works. Make sense? They're like, yeah. So the professional fee is in fact a tool that we use to market the property. Can I explain to you what I mean? Well, yeah. Well, let's imagine, Kristen, there was you and your significant other, you guys are purchasing a property and there are 10 properties that you want to look at within a five mile radius of your geographic area you want to be. And seven of them are offering out compensation to your buyer's agent in the form of a concession or a percentage of an agreed upon purchase and sales price. And three of them are offering out nothing. As a buyer, which properties do you think you would instruct your agent to show you first? One's offering compensation to your agent or one's offering nothing? And then, sh- and they'd be like, well, yeah, I mean, one's offering compensation. And then you tie it down by saying, why is that? Because if I can have it covered, like I won't have to pay for it. Exactly. So just by you saying that demonstrates that you recognize the professional fee is in fact a tool that we use to market the property. So now we can review the different options that you have. And again, whatever you decide, I'll support you. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, the first option is, is we offer out nothing. Now in doing so, as you just shared with me, we could end up affecting showings, which ultimately affects how much you can get. Now you do want to net the most, don't you, Kristen? Yes. Okay. You also shared with me, you guys want to, you know, make this sale happen in the next 120 days, which means we need to be under contract in the next 60 because it takes like 45, 60 days to close. So what would happen on the outside chance if we were still sitting here 120 days from now and it wasn't sold? You look at your house. That would be terrible, honey. We can't do that. Yep. So the, the other issue with offering out nothing is that it usually takes longer. So it really seems like based on what your goals are to net the most and do it in 60 days, that option wouldn't work for you, would it? No. Great. Second option is, is we can offer out a concession of some sort, right? Because we're still allowed to do that in the multiple listing service. And the idea behind that is, is that the concession can go towards the compensation of, you know, the, the buyer's agent, or it can go towards the buyer's closing costs, which would free up capital for them to be able to pay their buyer's agent. And what we're seeing as we kind of deal with this real time, you know, as it's working out in this price point, somewhere around 10, 12,000 bucks. The third option that we have at our disposal is what we've been doing for the last, you know, 50 years is that we offer out a percentage of the agreed upon purchase and sales price with an acceptable offer. And in doing so, we broaden the exposure the most, which increases the chances that we'll get the most in the quickest amount of time. So here's my question to you guys, based on what you're looking to accomplish and why, based on the time frame you'd like to make this happen in, which one of those two options do you think would serve you and your family best? And then shut up. And the vast majority of them will be like, well, honey, we really got to sell. Like, let's do it like a percentage. You're like, okay, great. What were you guys thinking? And then you come to an agreement and you're done. Exactly. And I think that it's an interesting kind of question that's been posed in light of all of this NAR settlement talk is, you know, should a listing agent be kind of pre-negotiating that compensation amount that's going to be offered to a buyer's agent. And um, I 100% agree with kind of the presentation you just gave. I think that would be extremely effective. Um, but I think another kind of option that would be interesting is, is you're sitting down with your seller and you say, you know, you're going to pay me whatever it is, 3%. That's my professional fee. Um, I need to educate you that we may have an offer come where a buyer is going to ask us to pay for all or a portion of their agent's compensation. And we don't know what that buyer has agreed to pay their agent. They could have agreed to pay them 1%, 3%, 5%. We don't know. So to go to your seller and say, hey, I need you to agree to 6%. We're going to offer 3% to the buyer's agent and 3% is going to go to me. I would consider stating, you know, you're going to pay me 3% and you should keep an open mind to any offers that come in that include compensation. We may have offer offers that come in and don't include any sort of contributing compensation. And then we can have it run the board. So if we're kind of pre-negotiating like, hey, I'm going to need the ten to $12,000 or I'm going to need the 6%, that number could be completely irrelevant because we know that buyer's agents cannot get more than what they've pre-agreed to with their buyer. So if they've already agreed to 2%, that's all they can get. And I mean, that's good news to your seller if they were planning on more, but kind of leaving that open-ended and say like, even if your position right now, Mr. Seller, is I don't want to pay anything to the buyer's agent, my 
recommendation is that if I get any inquiries asking, what are you offering buyer's agents or are you offering any compensation? The response should be, my seller will consider all reasonable offers. Like make the offer. As long as the numbers work out at the end of the day, how we get there should not matter on the seller side. Yeah, uh, that's an interesting point. And um, what it makes me think about is like in the commercial world, that's how they've done it forever. Exactly. So the listing, the buyer's agent calls the listing agent, yo, you guys offer compensation, whatever, including your offer, they make an LOI, including their compensation. People will pay for access. So if I help a seller self-discover how they need to position a property, so it's competitively positioned in the market where we get multiple offers, the probability that they're going to have to pay a bit like compensation, in my opinion, with a high degree of probability goes down dramatically. Because I've seen people, I'm sure you have, particularly, you know, in various different seasons of the real estate space. I've been selling real estate since 2006. So I saw it then. I saw it in 2020, 2021, people paying 25, 50, 75, 100, removing con- over ask price, removing appraisal contingencies, removing inspection contingencies. I remember because I was telling my wife, I'm like, this is ridiculous and completely financially irresponsible. Like when I saw people paying that much over and removing uh, like inspection contingencies, I was like, what are people doing? This is complete insanity. Yeah. We've, we've seen that too. I mean, sight unseen $50,000 escrow deposits, like anything they could do to be that winning offer. And so the market's also going to dictate that. Right. Um, I think it's, I think it should really be looked at on a case by case basis. You know, maybe it doesn't always make sense for a seller to offer compensation. In most cases, at least in our market right now, it probably does, but that's going to fluctuate with the market, with inflation, the overall economy, all of those sorts of factors. I agree. So because I also saw, because I sold real estate in 2007, eight and nine, like you mean to tell me when (laughs) <laughs> there were 20,000 homes for sale in Broward County. Like you mean to tell me that somebody's not going to pay 9% to get their home sold? hundred percent. They will. It's very much so market dictated. The other thing that it made me think about as we're kind of triangulating ideas is as a listing agent, helping somebody to self-discover that by positioning a property competitively price-wise, it increases the probability, not only that we'll get multiple offers and best terms and conditions, but that we won't have to, like we can save money on the professional fee because we can dictate from a place of strength versus, you know, you get one offer and that's not the same dynamic. So then you can ask a question be like, well, is that the position that you want to be in? Well, yeah. Okay. So then we have a choice. We can either list it higher and see what happens and then increase the chances that we'll have to pay compensation or extra compensation, or you can position it more competitively in alignment with what buyers and sellers are agreeing or a little bit below get multiple offers and therefore be in a situation where we can negotiate from a position of strength, dictate terms and conditions, and perhaps save you some money on the professional fee. Kind of going back to one of your earlier points, like that's why education is so important. It's less about kind of defending your value and your worth and your years in the business and you know how hard you work and how you're going to answer the phone at midnight and all of those sorts of things. <laughs> it's educating on here's how this is going to impact your bottom line. Here's if your priority is time. Like I need to get this sold by X date because I'm closing on a new construction house or I'm moving out of state or whatever it is. Like all of those things should be considered on a case by case basis. And then you respond to it by educating and letting them make the decision exactly how you just laid it out. I've told people that NAR never had an incentive for there to be less agents. Actually incentivized to have as many as possible. Right. Because they get dues, right? So, you know, Charlie Munger said, you have to be very careful how you incentivize people because it shapes behavior. So if your in, intention is to have as many people as possible, what you will do is make the barrier to entry as low as possible. I've always said for a long time, like it would have made sense. Like you can't call yourself an agent unless you do like 20 deals a year. Then you'd be like a junior agent. Just, I mean, they have junior associate, like junior, you know what I mean? Like that's what it should be. But so um, I guess from your perspective, do you perceive that a lot of agents, because 60 to 80% of them are buyer side heavy. So they're going to have to do a formal presentation, demonstrating value. They do not possess the sales skills that I just deployed. They're going to have to ask for money, which they've never had to do, like ever, like sit down and be like, this is what it is. Like I'm asking you for money. Like, do you see uh, a lot of that agent population just not being able to do that? I do. So, and I see that for a couple of reasons. So number one, the reason you just stated, um, in kind of going back to that barrier to entry, like 
the real estate industry is unique in the sense that the barrier to entry is so low that you can have, you know, stay at home moms that want to do this on evenings and weekends. You can have part timers. You can have people doing it as a side hustle. You can, of course, have the people doing it as a full time career. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But with the level of kind of preparation and education and value proposition that you're going to have to include in that presentation moving forward. I also think that buyer's agents are going to see a hit in the amount of compensation they get per deal. Um, because of those things combined, I think we are going to see a lot of agents drop out. And that's probably going to be the agents that are more the part-timers, side hustle type of agents. So we both agree that going to closings is an absolute unequivocal waste of time. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. 